Welcome to the debate. I'm your host, Sana Makbood, with you at BTV World. In today's show, we will be taking a look at Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif's visit to the SEO Summit uh, and, of course, uh, the Heads of Councils of meeting, which took place um, uh, on the SEO Summit as well, and the important meetings that were held on the sidelines, the most important of which that has made the highlights, of course, is uh, with uh, Vladimir Putin, the Russian president. And we know that this is something uh, that has been uh, a cause of much controversy at home and uh, the current political situation of the country as well with the ouster of the former prime minister uh, where relations uh, between Pakistan and Russia became quite the focus in terms of what was then talked about uh, by the BTI leadership uh, with regards to a US-led conspiracy what what was being alleged by their side of course these meetings uh, point out to the fact that Pakistan is irrespective of the change in government uh, quite willing to take it forward and wants to be able to engage uh, in front ties with Russia and make sure that they have an independent foreign policy, so to speak, um, which uh, is also evident in the fact that the Prime Minister Shabashri also had a positive meeting with the Iranian president. Uh, the important discussion regarding the meeting with the Russian president came with regards to the gas pipeline and the possibility of taking this forward that was put forward by Vladimir Putin in terms of the infrastructure that already exists and how this can be taken forward in the next step in the dynamics of this relationship. How exactly Exactly, is that going to happen? Uh, whether or not we're going to be seeing a sustained positive trajectory between Pakistan and Russia, and how we're going to be balancing our foreign policy initiatives and interests with regards to our relationship with the US is what is going to be our focus in the first segment of the show today. Our next segment is going to take a look at what is going on in India with regards uh, to the crackdown on any sort of dissent or any sort of voice regarding uh, the political uh, issues or uh, highlighting the human rights violations against the, the people in Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir and other minorities within India as well, in which we've seen numerous voices uh, paying uh, the, uh, the uh, issue with regards to what the BJP, of course, is doing and not allowing for any difference of opinion. Um, there is, of course, the clause present in the Indian constitution for freedom of speech, uh, but then, of course, we see that on ground what has been happening is completely different. Uh, and there has been uh, a lot of persecution and suffering for journalists and media outlets and uh, almost any and everyone who has raised their voice or criticized the government or talked about the human rights violations that exist, which include the use of the software Pegasus, in which we spoke about uh, previously as well, um, how this came to the forefront, that this is something that has been used by India to be able to call out any sort of dissent to be able to uh, put a crackdown on journalists and dissenting voices and then of course uh, be able to even arrest uh, the, the people that they think are disagreeing with the government's policies. Uh, this of course uh, moving forward has somehow also been defended by the Indian administration considering of course the statements that come in uh, regarding how they believe that media outlets are not responsible to call out the government or hold it accountable uh, and how in fact anybody who is raising their voice or ha has has been uh, persecuted is because uh, it was an anti-nationalist agenda that they were following. So we're going to be taking a look at this particular development, what it means in terms of freedom of press within India. That is going to be our focus in the debate today. For this and more, I've been joined in the studios as always by senior analyst Farooq Patafi, and we've also been joined by Mr. Khalid Tamur Akram, who's executive director of Pakistan Research Center for a Community with Shared Future. Thank you very much for joining us in the studios. We've also been joined online by Professor Emma Dussol, Director of the Orsam Center for Middle Eastern Studies. Thank you very much, Mr. Emmett, for joining us. And apologies if I did not take your name correctly. We'll, uh, we'll also be joined by Mr. Andre Kortanov after a short while, who's the Director General of the Russian International Affairs Council, and talk to him more with regards to the Prime Minister's meeting with the Russian President. Well, let me start with you, uh, Mr. Khalid. When we take a look at this particular visit and the significance, we discussed this yesterday as well, what it means to be a uh, part of this body in general and how the Prime Minister also emphasized on how it represents 40% of the world's interests and how it's an important platform for people to discuss bilateral and regional issues. Of course, the meeting with the Russian president is an important one, but we'll come to that. But in a larger scale, this meeting was also important in terms of highlighting the devastating floods that have been going on in the country, you talk about climate change, something that the prime minister also tweeted about. Uh, but moreover, we want to understand uh, the significance of uh, the time of this meeting and the impact that's going to have on Pakistan's renewed stance when it comes to foreign relations. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, let me congratulate uh, uh, 
the government of Uzbekistan and uh, the president of Uzbekistan, His Excellency Shavkat Mirziyoyev, for arranging and hosting such a big uh, uh, conference. And uh, this is the first time after the post-pandemic post era that such a uh, uh, high-level meeting is held. Uh, this SCO head of the state and head of the government uh, conference is basically an annual event which happens every year, but it has not happened since last two years uh, uh, due to uh, the COVID situation. Uh, this conference uh, is uh, of lots of significance. One, because of uh, the current uh, standoff between uh, Russia and Ukraine. And secondly, we know that uh, our NATO and American forces have gone out of Afghanistan and the onus in peace in Afghanistan now lies with this region and the regional countries. And in last one year, uh, including Pakistan, the regional countries have been playing a very important role in bringing peace to Afghanistan. So in that connection, uh, this head of the states and head of the uh, government meeting was very, very important. And today, I was just going through the, uh, 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 at the end of the conference, which uh, the declaration of the conference, which was signed by all the uh, member states, uh, it says very clearly, uh, one, uh, that uh, the regional countries, uh, the SCO countries will work together uh, in the fields of uh, technology, in the fields of culture, in the field of tourism. And uh, they have also uh, agreed to, uh, to make special economic zones all across the Shanghai Cooperation Organization countries. And also in the city of Termez, uh, in, uh, Termez in uh, Uzbekistan, uh, all the SCO countries have agreed to make an humanitarian uh, city uh, mm. for uh, helping the Afghan uh, population. In addition to that, uh, this meeting has also provided uh, Prime Minister Shabar Sharif to convey Pakistan's point of view. And uh, let me also commend uh, the government and the Prime Minister on, uh, because since last two days, he had a very hectic schedule and he met with almost every head of the state and head of the government uh, who had come over there, whether it be uh, Vladimir Putin or whether it be President Xi Jinping right. or the Uzbek president. So uh, he had put across Pakistan's point of view. And also uh, on the sidelines of this declaration, the Uzbek president in his concluding speech had also appealed uh, to all the SCO countries to help Pakistan's flood victims. I think this is quite a That's major of course achievement. Absolutely important considering what is going on in the country right now. Uh, but Farooq, when we take a look at the um, overall achievements in terms of what Pakistan needs to have in terms of its relationship with different countries and particularly the platform of the SEO, what really do you think would be our gain from this particular summit? Right. Uh, Sama, uh, Sana, uh, the question is very important and I think that we can talk about uh, uh, the overall situation. Uh, the visit was very successful. There were 14 head of states uh, uh, present there, or head of governments, and the prime minister actually met 11 of them. This is the highest record on this forum by any Pakistani leader. So that that is one thing. But of course, uh, there are many other important issues. There are issues that actually have been very close to Pakistan's heart. Uh, for example, climate change is now an issue. And the great news is that SEO has decided to form uh, a climate council that is going to come into being next year, right? Uh, similarly, transport, uh, you know, uh, summit is go actually, the transport co conference is also going to take place. Similarly, uh, uh, you know, when it comes to anti-terrorism structures, they have a mechanism called RATS, uh, regional anti-terrorism structures. So they are going to assess their issues or their concerns as well in the coming days as well. Uh, and then we can talk about the uh, overall situation, the economic uh, trade integration, as was pointed out by our worthy guest here. Uh, that is also going to be there. Uh, but mm. uh, looking at the l long list of meetings that the uh, prime minister had, one has to actually take note of one meeting that did not happen. Last night, uh, yesterday also, we were talking about the importance mm. of that. It reminds me of another meeting uh, where India or the then government actually dropped the ball. And that was on the sidelines of the UNGA uh, when Prime Minister uh, Nawaz Sharif and uh, Indian, uh, the then Indian Prime Minister Manmohan Singh met. And at that time, he was not allowed, the Indian Prime Minister was not allowed to actually, uh, you know, 
uh, actually work on bilaterals or bilateral relationship and that was a missed opportunity after that Narendra Modi came into power. Mm. And now this time also it was a great moment when the two sides could have met and they could have found an even keel for the regional peace, mm. but that did not happen. That was uh, unfortunate. But full marks to the government, full marks to the SEO host. And I think that in coming days, what we are going to see is further cultural integration as well. They are right. uh, creating a digital forum uh, for exchange of culture, museums, libraries, such. Uh, things and that is also good news. Absolutely, that's very encouraging to hear. Let me also welcome in the debate Mr. Andrei Kortonov, a Director General <coughs> of the Russian International Affairs Council. Thank you very much Mr. Andre, for joining us and being a part of the debate. Of course one of the most important meetings that the Prime Minister of Pakistan had uh, was uh, with the Russian President Vladimir Putin um, and when we take a look at the kind of uh, political situation and dynamics that unfolded at home since the last visit of the previous Prime Minister of course that was also uh, something that came uh, in the international media as well in terms of what really uh, was talked about uh, from the US side, the alleged conspiracy uh, that was planned because of this. But irrespective of that, since of course that's been refuted, but at the moment when we talk about the kind of dynamics that exist and how Pakistan needs to evolve its relationships uh, with Russia, uh, there is of course the dynamic of the US that still remains. Um, and I'll talk more about that, but firstly, with specific regards to this meeting, there is of course the offer of the gas pipeline uh, from the Russian side and the fact that the current infrastructure already exists and that it's only a matter of taking it forward. Um, this of course was part of the meeting uh, that was uh, held on the, uh, in, on the sidelines of the SEO summit. But moving forward, what do you think will be uh, the situation's uh, dynamic and how exactly will this particular energy transaction or trade relations with Russia evolve? I think that uh, the meeting suggests that uh, the importance of Pakistan uh, for the Russian Federation is growing. And indeed, uh, Russia is considering redirecting uh, its energy partnerships uh, from the west uh, to the east and to the south. Uh, without Pakistan, it would be difficult uh, to meet this objective. So it's natural that they discuss the pipeline. I think that the energy cooperation can go beyond the pipeline. Uh, they can uh, definitely compare notes on energy transition, on uh, renewables, uh, maybe on uh, uh, atomic energy. Uh, so the agenda is quite broad, and I think the challenge is to make sure that it is not uh, uh, limited uh, to summit meetings, but uh, is uh, converted into practical projects with uh, both private and public sectors involved. Right, uh, Dr. Kartanov, uh, well, since we are talking about energy cooperation between the two countries, uh, it is part of uh, uh, SEO's mandate as well. Uh, do you think that uh, despite the, the fact that there are many moving parts, for example, Afghanistan and uh, umpteen other issues there, uh, you think that this region will be able to work together and uh, pull together in coming days? Well, there are many obstacles, and uh, Afghanistan is one of them. We have also instability in some Central Asian countries, and that uh, might uh, uh, put uh, some of multilateral initiatives in jeopardy. But uh, where is the uh, will? There is a way. Uh, so I do hope uh, that these obstacles uh, can be overcome, I, and uh, definitely uh, such projects uh, can benefit all the region, uh, including countries in between, including countries like Afghanistan, so we can uh, count uh, on uh, uh, rational thinking in Kabul and in other places that would allow these projects uh, to take off uh, and uh, to uh, produce results uh, beneficial uh, to societies in these countries. Right. right. Uh, independent of, uh, you know, uh, everything else, uh, we saw a creation of a fund for Afghanistan as well. Do you think that it will actually work independent of UN and the US influences? or it is going to work in tandem with that? Well, uh, I would like uh, to see no competition uh, between various funds that sit in Afghanistan because uh, the demands are huge uh, and uh, definitely any actor interested uh, in working in this country will, will find uh, his or her place uh, for doing so. Uh, but uh, we know that uh, the United States uh, sometimes uh, uh, politically loads uh, its assistance projects, so I think it would be wrong uh, to depend uh, on the goodwill coming from Washington. Uh, if uh, they can assist, uh, let them get on the board, 
and participate uh, if they pursue narrowly defined political goals. I think it will be up to the government of Afghanistan to decide whether the government is ready to accept this assistance or not. Right, absolutely. Um, uh, Mr. Emma, thank you for waiting so uh, patiently for this long. But we only have Mr. Andre Kotnov for a couple more minutes, so I'm just going to take one or two questions more from him and come back to you uh, with regards to this discussion. Uh, Mr. Kotnov, uh, there is, of course, the factor in from Pakistan's side regarding our dynamic with the U.S. Um, I want to understand what sort of a role or influence uh, will that factor in in our relationship with Russia from the Russian side as well? Well, uh, I think that uh, the ball uh, is uh, on the uh, uh, Pakistan side. Uh, uh, Pakistan might be exposed to secondary sanctions by the United States if it pursues uh, cooperation with Russia, especially in such sensitive uh, areas uh, as uh, 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 military hardware or, you know, high tech. So I think that uh, Pakistan has to fine tune uh, its policies not to expose itself to uh, excessive risks, but at the same time, uh, it doesn't have uh, to follow uh, every advice that comes from Washington. Uh, I hope that uh, in the end of the day, uh, the Russian-U.S. relations uh, will get stable, but I'm afraid that it will not happen too soon. So we face a bumpy road ahead, and this is something that should be kept in mind by all politicians all over the place. Right, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Cortano, stay with us uh, for a few more minutes and I have more to discuss with you. But Mr. Emmett, uh, considering, of course, this important uh, SEO summit and the meetings on the sidelines, another important meeting for Pakistan was with the Iranian president as well. And we, uh, of course, have the U.S. dynamic in this particular relationship as well. Moving forward, of course, there's a lot, lots of factors that Pakistan also need to take into account with Iran, especially with relation to counterterrorism efforts as well. What sort of an uh, evolution do you think between these two countries, considering that Pakistan wants to take forward an independent foreign policy based on its own national interest? Uh, how do you see our relationship with Iranians develop with the U.S. dynamic? I mean, uh, of course, Iran is, uh, uh, first of all, of course, I have to explain my condolences and uh, my sympathies for the victims of uh, all these huge flooding and, you know, our hearts with, with the Pakistani people. Uh, really a big, big disaster. Uh, and uh, secondly, I mean, we need a, a kind of a peaceful neighbor, but uh, of course, uh, Iran is, is kind of acting in a in an opposite way, uh, being more like jealous neighbor than, uh, than a friendly neighbor and uh, doesn't like uh, Pakistan. And especially after, after the Afghanistan issue, you know, he sees that he's circled by, of course, by a Sunni bloc or Sunni countries and Turkey being in the West. And these uh, create tensions, I think, uh, with Iran and uh, Pakistan. And I, we also s see that they are not happy with the Karabakh Armenian uh, uh, issue or the success of Azerbaijan to recover their territories. And also with the, the, a lot of victimization also they are playing, you know, they do the uh, maybe unjust things and they blame others for uh, for this, but uh, I think in Shanghai, at least, there is a kind of platform to discuss all these discussion and dialogue is a lot better than than uh, conflict and uh, maybe uh, bad words. Uh, I think they sit together. Of course, Turkey and Iran, and Turkey and uh, or Pakistan and Iran, they sit a lot uh, to discuss this, but they they don't make much progress. But at the end, we are uh, brothers and sisters, we are neighbors, we have a lot uh, positive, if we share them, uh, or win-win uh, mentality should uh, prevail, and we have, uh, we can serve a lot, we, our people, especially in this critical period of history, with the Ukraine war, global conflicts, etc., we should uh, bring our acts, acts together, and we are saying this to also saying this to the Iranians, but, uh, you know, they think differently, but I think they wake up. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you very much uh, for those sentiments. Uh, Mr. Kortanov, uh, the, uh, of course, factor with regards to counterterrorism efforts is also something which is very important to Pakistan, especially uh, with reference to what is going on in Afghanistan and even the recent spike in terrorist activities within Pakistan and uh, the terrorist groups within Afghanistan at the moment. Uh, considering, of course, that uh, this was something that was appreciated in the meeting between the Prime Minister and Vladimir Putin as well, that uh, Russia's constructive role has obviously helped, and we welcome 
uh, all international efforts to stabilizing Afghanistan. Moving forward, do you think that Pakistan and Russia can also collaborate with regards to counterterrorism efforts, especially in relation to Afghanistan? Your mic, sir. Mr. Kortanov, can you please unmute I'm sure yourself? That, uh, yes. Has a very important, I would say, a central role to play uh, in combating terrorism in Afghanistan, and of course, it is it's a problem to uh, everybody uh, because uh, uh, just uh, you know a couple of days ago there was a terrorist attack close to the Russian embassy in Kabul. Uh, so we are all interested uh, in containing ISIS, uh, in dealing with Al Qaeda, and in making sure that uh, terrorism uh, is uh, not something that uh, Afghanistan might export to neighboring countries. Uh, we know that uh, Taliban uh, is uh, not uh, pursuing uh, such a kind of expansionist uh, policy. It is not uh, considering terrorist uh, attacks uh, on uh, neighboring countries. But there are many other forces uh, in uh, Afghanistan which uh, might have uh, other ideas uh, about promoting their goals in neighboring countries. So the Pakistani role uh, is of critical importance. I'm sure that there is a lot of opportunities for cooperation between Russia, uh, Pakistan, and some other regional players. Right, absolutely. Mr. Ahmed, uh, considering uh, what has been said earlier and, and what you were sharing, of course, exists in terms of our cultural and historic ties with various countries and the kind of moral responsibility that has been highlighted. Uh, but most often, as you earlier also saying, we see that we don't really see that translate into action. Um, in terms of, of course, the SEO summit and the kind of importance that such platforms exist, it seems that perhaps the bilateral relationships evolve irrespective of the dynamics of these bodies. Uh, moving forward, what sort of impact do you think this is going to have on the larger region? I don't uh, hear the studio. Pakistan? Can you hear me? I can I now hear you, but I don't hear anyone else. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mr. Ahmed, can you hear me? I hope they come back. I feel like we've lost contact with both Mr. Ahmed anyway, and Mr. Anyway, it was Kortanov. nice to see you. And <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, the yeah, Phoenix they're, Mutual, they're exchanging likewise. mutual pleasantries as well. Right, they're exchanging <laughs> that with themselves. Yeah. But thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ahmed and Mr. Korsano, for joining us. And we hope we'll be able to get Mr. Ahmed back in the okay. conversation, uh, since I don't think they're able to hear me at the you're, moment. You're closing. Right. Um, so, uh, Mr. Khalid, considering, of course, what I was going to talk to Mr. Ahmed about is important because there is a lot of conversation. There is, of course, the existence of such platforms. Um, and there is talk with regards to how to take things forward. Uh, but uh, we don't see them translate into action. Um, when we talk about how bilateral relationships develop and evolve, how much of an impact will such bodies as the SEO have in terms of our relationships with particular countries in the region? Uh, yes, I would say this thing that uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization since last couple of years uh, is becoming very potent. Uh, if we just look at uh, the regional conflicts which have been happening in this region, uh, if we get the data of last five years, uh, so it is very evident that uh, especially in our region, uh, the uh, minor conflicts uh, and even the major conflicts are not taken to the United Nations. and. Uh, they are resolved within the region. For example, uh, let me give you an example of uh, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan border dispute. They had a border dispute for almost 25, 26 years. Mm -hmm. And in last few years, they had not only resolved uh, the border dispute uh, in their bilateral relationship, but uh, they have opened uh, almost nine to 10 uh, border entry points in each other countries. Uh, then we have seen uh, uh, in 2020, we had seen uh, the 44-day war between Armenia and Azerbaijan in which uh, the Azerbaijan liberated their uh, uh, disputed Karabakh, areas, yeah. uh, Karabakh area. And we saw uh, mediation by uh, Russia in that. Uh, United Nation was uh, nowhere to be seen. Then uh, we saw uh, uh, an incident between uh, uh, India and uh, China, which was again mutually resolved. Uh, it is still not resolved, but uh, some mutual solution was agreed between China and India. So a Shanghai Cooperation Organization not only provides a multilateral platform, but it also provides an uh, independent platform where the stakeholders can jointly sit together and have the bilateral uh, meetings with each other. As uh, Mr. Patafi rightly said that in last two days, our prime minister had met with 11 head of the states. Hmm. So meeting with 11 head of the states in two days, you can't travel to 11 countries in two days. 
so it, uh, it it was and all the meetings were very very meaningful for example pakistan and uzbekistan decided to continue with the uh, rail connectivity platform the central south asia corridor which is being prepared uh, in which uh, the major project is the railway line project 760 kilometer railway line uh, being laid from uh, um, um, uh, from uh, tashkent to mazar e sharif and uh, afghanistan and till peshawar which will link which will link all the central asian countries with the arabian sea uh, then our prime ministers meeting with the turkish president then our prime ministers meeting with the iranians and uh, of course with the russian uh, president in which uh, he had himself offered that using the existing infrastructure of the uh, gas pipeline which is uh, which was already there in the soviet times right. uh, using that infrastructure and taking it all along to pakistan right. and especially uh, i would like to mention over here uh, the biggest role of the regional countries uh, since uh, 15th of august uh, 2021 once uh, all of a sudden uh, the american and the nato forces left and there was a big vacuum in the afghan situation and uh, uh, there was a fear uh, that uh, the terrorism and uh, the terrorist organization may flow out of afghanistan to the neighboring countries so at that time a very responsible role was seen by pakistan uh, tajikistan iran and uzbekistan where they all uh, got together at one platform and uh, then they decided to uh, talk to taliban then they decided to meet with them and uh, since last one year we have seen that the region is very very stable right. so the regional uh, uh, platforms play lot of role and seo is not a dead horse seo is uh, progressing with every day and expanding every day uh, uh, so i hope that in next uh, couple of years pakistan will be uh, playing a very major role in that and by the way right. let me tell you also that right now uh, one of the deputy secretary generals of the seo is uh, from pakistan hmm. Hmm. absolutely so of course uh, the significance increases uh, but for uh, i want to understand when when we talk about the current situation in pakistan you've been highlighting the major issues and uh, paradoxes so to speak where pakistan yeah. is currently facing um, Three and and th they're important of course considering our uh, reality at the moment i want to understand what sort of a contribution would the seo or our regional partners be able to play with regards to these current interests that pakistan currently have especially in terms of counterterrorism efforts or energy issues of course there's the obvious uh, energy, um, uh, the gas pipeline uh, offer from Russian side, but in terms of actually contributing towards the development of our current situation, will we be able to see any regional partners coming together in terms of counterterrorism efforts, um, as uh, Mr. Khalid was talking about earlier, or in terms of the energy or economic issues we're facing? Right, uh, Sana, uh, uh, two very quick uh, uh, recaps. One, uh, uh, regarding those three uh, paradoxes that I keep speaking about. One is Afghanistan that seems now almost unfixable because one great power has actually withdrawn and now no one is directly involved. So because of that, uh, it seems that no party can come in and change the situation on ground. So that becomes a paradox and uh, especially it is worrying for Pakistan because uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan share a very long border. The second one is our economic situation and because of that we have been suffering and the scale of this thing also seems uh, uh, you know disproportionate and big the third one of course the floods that have actually sunk one third of pakistan and took the, that uh, under water that is also a very serious issue now the second recap is about uh, my interview with the secretary general of sco uh, uh, on rebel ambassador Zhang ming when I was talking about bilateral issues and disputes that need to be resolved, uh, 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 Khalid Sahib is absolutely right when he was talking about the, the fact that there, there can be a bilateral platform provided by SEO. But he actually pointed out that the SEO, because of his char charter and uh, Shanghai, uh, uh, Shanghai spirit, hmm. will not be able to actually resolve the bilateral issues, right? Uh, so there is a limit to it, but they are, uh, look at how many countries and how important countries there are. For example, China is a part of it, right? China offers technological uh, breakthrough to all the countries. And in the immediate or later on as well, perhaps it can help all these countries find its, uh, their own technological feet. 
similarly, economically, China is investing humongously in these regions because of BRI, other projects as well. So that can also take off. Uh, then, of course, uh, when you talk about climate change, India and Pakistan share a border, and India and Pakistan are both victims of climate change. So that can also actually somehow be built up in coming days, provided the two sides actually start talking to each other. And uh, of course, uh, when you talk about the economic situation overall, um, I think Russia, China, both can be great help. But right now, the situation is such, you know, when you talk about our access to Central Asia, there are two routes that are available to us, right? One is Afghanistan, which is in bad shape itself. The other one is uh, Iran, which is highly sanctioned. So one has to actually hope that in coming days we are going to see at least some kind of resolution because the talks between Iran and the West are continuing despite all odds. Mm. Uh, so we can hope that perhaps there can be some softening of those sanctions so that Pakistan can get the access to Central Asia through Iran as well. And then of course we have to work on the bilaterals with India and Afghanistan because they are very serious issues and Pakistan has to actually con concentrate on that. I don't think that this uh, uh, categorization of uh, actually or denial that uh, SEO is not dead horse is going to cut it because SEO actually is so vibrant and ha full of potential mm -hmm. that it might actually have to underplay its own uh, significance right now because of uh, the way uh, the voices of propaganda continue in the West regarding the need for decoupling with China and somehow containing Russia and China as well. I think at this moment, SEO will continue its uh, work without actually drawing too much attention to it, but it is the uh, cooperation of the next uh, uh, coming hmm. decades. It is going to have but significant impact. Right. Farooq, when you, when you say Pakistan's focusing on its bilateral relations with countries like India as well, how exactly should Pakistan be able to proceed with that, especially when we talk about how the meeting didn't happen on the sidelines of the SEO yeah. summit? Uh, it was also said from the SEO side that it, the meeting wasn't sought by both the sides as well. Should Pakistan have done that? Uh, no, I, d I don't think Pakistan should be actually seeking that kind of uh, a meeting at such a forum. I think Pakistani leaders repeatedly have extended, uh, you know, calls for cooperation or dialogue between the two countries, and mm. that has been happening. The previous prime minister, the current prime minister, army chief, the president, and uh, pa heads of all parties, they have been speaking about this for quite some time. The problem is the other side, because they are so much involved with the optics of everything, right. every time there is a kind of, uh, you know, uh, some kind of blowback from the media, they pull back and they start acting, uh, you know, muscular. So at this moment, we'll have to wait and see how our other partners, the, may it be SEO countries, may it be other countries, uh, might be able to actually play a role behind the scenes to bring both sides on the table. But I think that there will have to be, there's only one country at this moment that is opposing dialogue between the two countries, that is India itself. Mm -hmm. And if uh, that country can also be convinced, at least to some extent, we can have some kind of, uh, you know, room to maneuver and to mm. room to actually build on. Right, absolutely. Um, uh, Mr. Ahmed, um, I hope you can hear me and we can hear you this time around. Um, there was some confusion uh, the pre in the previous time around and we lost Mr. Ardu Kotanov uh, at that point. I might have jinxed this right now when <laughs> yeah. I say this. But, <laughs> Immediately. Um, hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to still get some something out of Mr. Ahmed. Um, considering what we have, what has been said earlier reg with regards to the kind of cultural, historic uh, bonds that we have with different countries, that, that brotherhood is important. And I understand uh, the, how it factors in our relationship with various countries. Uh, but there are issues on a regional and local level as well that perhaps different countries uh, across the region experience, uh, such as issues of Islamophobia. Um, when we talk about this at home, of course, it, it means a lot to Pakistan, as was also uh, talked about in the campaign by the previous leadership as well at the United Nations and other fora. Um, but when we take a look at the individual ways that different countries take, uh, uh, not just Islamophobia, but perhaps other issues, uh, other conflicts, um, uh, other factors that are important to Pakistan may not be the same in other parts of the world. If we don't have an alignment uh, over the way that we look at various views, how do you propose that we are able to move forward in terms of a unified approach to tackle them? Yes, we have major challenges. You, do, you don't have a good uh, neighborhood or uh, 
a lot of problems around from India to Afghanistan and Iran is not also cooperative as we as we said. Also, great powers uh, are not very helpful. Also, uh, uh, Pakistan also living uh, suffering from terrorism as well as uh, floods and all this. And uh, this is a big challenge. Of course, we need to be cooperative more. And Turkey managed to achieve a certain degree of stability and uh, prosperity or development, even though we have challenges, but it is stable. And Pakistan is a very uh, I mean, significant uh, Muslim country. We cooperate in all platforms from the Islamic cooperation and others. Uh, and uh, we have uh, similar problems also. And uh, so moving forward without, uh, I mean, backlash or without setback, uh, Turkish-Pakistani uh, cooperation is very critical. As a center also, we uh, we try to emphasize the Pakistan. I mean, uh, Pakistan should not fall from Turkey's radar, um, even though we have uh, several problems in our region with Greece, Armenia, all this, and uh, Syria with the PKK and Americans. Uh, unfortunately, we, we are... Uh, you know, uh, challenged by all this, but uh, at the end, we, uh, if we, uh, you know, help each other sometime, even morally, you know, uh, just being next to next to your friend or your brother means a lot. And in this uh, situation, Absolutely. Turkey, uh, and, and, yes. And we hope that uh, leaders around the world uh, share the way that you think as well. But thank you very much, uh, Professor Emil, for joining us and being a part of thank the you. debate. Uh, we'll talk now about the uh, situation with regards to uh, what is going on within India in terms of the crackdown on journalists and any uh, person who has a different opinion uh, than the BJP and calls out the government for its actions, be it human rights violations uh, or its decisions with regards to minorities uh, within India. Uh, Mr. Khalid, this is of course is an important factor considering how we have seen the situation deteriorate even further um, and uh, not having any room or space uh, to uh, be able to say what is happening uh, or to support the victims of human rights violations or criticize or hold the government accountable for its actions and that's an important job for uh, of media outlets and of journalists but it doesn't seem to be uh, the case or the emphasis given by the Indian administration uh, for this important pillar. Um, considering of course the use of Pegasus, uh, the software uh, which India has been using against journalists and to be uh, to have a crackdown against any dissenting voices, this is something uh, that perhaps need uh, some sort of consequence and some, some sort of action in terms of a global condemnation on a basic level. But we don't see any consequence uh, coming in for India, no matter uh, whatever outcome uh, exists, no matter what sort of discovery is made as to what is going on. Uh, if that is the case and that is the situation, when we talk about such crackdowns or such issues within India, how are we even going to start um, holding these uh, people accountable? Yeah, first of all, if we see that uh, now it is almost going to be two years plus that uh, India has abrogated Article 370 and uh, 35 in uh, uh, their constitution uh, as regards to uh, the occupied Kashmir. And although Pakistan and our friendly countries have been talking and have been raising this point, but we have seen absolutely the Indian government has not moved. Mm. Uh, and uh, ever since then, uh, especially in last two years, uh, there has been a deliberate movement by the uh, Modi government uh, to curb any sort of dissenting voice. And uh, uh, India has become more of authoritative regime countries rather than a democratic country. They have been uh, uh, arresting people without any warrants. They have been putting people behind the bar. Uh, the journalism is not free. If you see any Indian channel, if uh, they are uh, uh, speaking the voice of RSS or the Modi government's voice, then they are allowed to air. Otherwise, any sort of dissenting note is not allowed. Mm. Uh, we have seen uh, how Indian government has been using social media and, of course, these kind of uh, spyware uh, softwares to uh, tap the telephones. And as per the statistics which were given uh, by the independent uh, agencies uh, around the world, uh, more than 50,000 telephones were being tapped at one time in India, and they were all of uh, major politicians who had uh, who would speak against the RSS or the Muji regime. So I think that India has turned up into a strong authoritative regime rather than a democratic country. But somehow uh, they feel 
that they can get away with everything because they are a strong economic power and but they are getting uh, away with everything. yes they are getting are they away with that because uh, most of the european countries and western countries have their vested in interest in india they have their investments in india they have their uh, software companies they have their because of the cheap labor and a big market uh, uh, they are safeguarding their own interests they that's why they are just keeping quiet uh, so uh, i think that is high time uh, that uh, they should these western countries especially america and the other uh, european union countries must come forward and at least speak they talk of human rights in china they talk of human rights in pakistan they talk of uh, 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 the uh, even the labor rights in china and in pakistan and these countries but uh, nobody talks about the freedom of press nobody talks about the freedom of common people in india so right. and that is the reason and of course we understand why that is and we have talked about this at length before but farooq there seems to be no space for anti democratic setups uh, well if it's not india uh, in Definitely. the world and that's yeah. what th that's what's been happening for quite some time now and i can understand the economic and other interests of course that are involved here um, but if that is the case then is there anything that can be done for any sort of consequence to exist uh, right uh, sana and that is a great question uh, we have been talking about this for quite some time you know uh, if you remember the, it has been over 2 years that we have been discussing the nso group uh, the israeli company that sold pegasus software to india and you know uh, the way it was actually bought because then india had to actually vote uh, in support of or withdraw a uh, vote against uh, uh, sorry in support of uh, palestinians right at the un and th that was the trade off and that continued similarly uh, uh, talk about indian media right now there was only one company i think one media company that was thought to be independent to an extent uh, independent that was ndtv and then we learn that uh, you know gautam adani uh, adani mm. actually the billionaire who is now sort of uh, incidentally the second richest man in the world uh, happened yesterday actually he has bought that company and that company is now going to be forced to be pro modi as well uh, you know when we talk about consequences and especially consequences in the international arena we can attribute it to the silence or the interest of the western countries but that is not so the biggest issue at this moment is uh, that in international system there is a delaying mechanism cons for consequences to come in for example bush administration between 2002 uh, to 2008 or 7 or 8 actually broke all the international norms and what happened they were gradually punished right mm. on one side uh, my first americans actually tried to bring in president obama so that gitmo can be closed that uh, the us uh, can withdraw from all the international dispute of forever wars that did not happen then they put out in trump and uh, when trump came the international order uh, sort of broke down and nobody was taking america very seriously back then right these are consequences what india is doing right now uh, it is using its holding power or its diplomatic muscle to actually squeeze on dissent mm. internationally as well but that capacity is limited and is subjected to only one thing right the interest of other companies and governments so it can always go down and it will rest assured what happens okay. then because you have already uh, you know uh, created a digital foot map uh, a digital map of uh, what do you call it authoritarian activities it is going to haunt them it is going to come back and haunt them yesterday somebody was saying that whatever we were doing in 1970s particularly in 1979 onwards india has actually turned into that ally right now Uh, it started in 2019 but, uh, when modi administration after the pretense of 5 years in government actually decided that it, it is going to go totally authoritarian it mm. did so i assure you that i don't know whether narendra modi is going to once again be returned in 2024 or not mm. or whether his party is going to be returned but i assure you whoever is going to be in power in 2024 is going to be punished by everything by uh, through the digital media through international whisper campaigns and then the pressures as well okay. finally one word uh, one more uh, uh, anecdote uh, regarding twitter 
Twitter recently uh, sued, uh, you know, uh, Indian government. And do you know what happened? Recently, we learned that uh, uh, Indian government has used its power to install its own agent in their board. Mm. So that is also happening. India right now might be rewarded by the broken world order, but it won't be for a long time. It will be punished. Right, and of course, uh, we hope to see that the suffering uh, does not continue within India, but of course, even this uh, seems to be a chaotic series of events, and we hope that uh, saner voices prevail and we're able to uh, sort of take action and change things sooner rather than later. That's all that we have from the brain. Thank you very much, Mr. Khalid, for joining us, and Farooq for always being on the Thank show. Thank you. That's all that we have. See you tomorrow and on Monday. Have a nice weekend.